good afternoon, depending where you're joining us from. Welcome to the 22nd Toronto Annual Ukrainian Famine Lecture. My name is Marta Bazouk, and I'm Executive Director of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium. Uh, we are a project of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta. BREC promotes research, study, and teaching and understanding of the Holodomor, the famine in Ukraine of 1932-1933 through a range of academic and educational initiatives. Some of you may have seen a notice for tonight's event calling it the Toronto Annual Ukrainian Famine Lecture, which is actually the correct full name. Uh, some of the postings only said Annual Ukrainian Famine Lecture. Uh, this is because I thought perhaps it would be confusing as I'm in Toronto, as is the office of HREC. We are part of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta, and our speaker is joining us tonight virtually from British Columbia. Just a few more words before I turn the event over to Professor Frank Sisson, head of the executive committee of HREC, and also the director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research. I want to thank our co-sponsors tonight. They are St. Vladimir Institute, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress Toronto branch, the Petro Yatsik program for the study of Ukraine at the University of Toronto, and the Canadian Foundation for Ukrainian Studies. Um, I would also like to thank the Temerte Foundation. HREC was established in 2013, thanks to the funding from the Temerte Foundation, and the foundation has generously funded the work of HREC since that time, for which we are extremely grateful. Uh, I won't say much more about HREC, except to encourage you to visit our website to see the range of our initiatives, holodomor.ca. I will mention that HREC has a, an online conference, December 9th through 11th. It should be a fascinating conference. It's called Narrating the Holodomor, which will consider the history and impact of the Holodomor through survivor and witness testimonies. And I would also take this opportunity to point out an event that will take place Monday and Tuesday, virtually, organized by the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. It's an online symposium Ukraine in the context of 30 years of identity building in post-communist Europe. You can find links on the website of the Institute, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. I'll mention the format quickly. Our, we'll listen to the presentation and then you'll be able to ask questions through the Q&A button at the bottom and we will re read the questions uh, from our end. And with that, I would like to hand over the proceedings to Frank Sisson. Yes, I'd like to greet you at this, I think I just heard 22nd uh, annual famine lecture. As I do every year, I point out, as far as we know, this is the longest continuing annual lecture that, about the famine or Holodomor, as it is more frequently called today. Uh, and we are honored today uh, to have a distinguished speaker, Professor Serhii Yekelchik. Professor Yakelchik was born in Kayu and studied at the Faculty of History at the Taras Shevchenko University, where he specialized in the history of late Imperial Russia. After graduating in 1989, he joined the Institute of History of the National Academy of Sciences, where he worked under the super supervision of the leading authority on 19th century Ukrainian history, Professor Vitaly Serbey. In 1992, he defended his candidate thesis on Western historiography of the Ukrainian national movement during the 19th and early 20th centuries. He then departed for a one-year research fellowship to the Antipode, that is to Monash University in Melbourne, where he explored questions of Ukrainian history and post-colonial theory and methods of Western cultural history working with the influential Australian Ukrainians, Ukrainianist Marko Pavlishin. In 1995, Professor Yekelchuk was accepted into the PhD program in Eastern European history at the University of Alberta, where he was supervised by John Paul Himka, while also working closely with Zenon Kohut and D David Marples on their research projects at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. In 2000, he defended his doctoral dissertation on historical men memory and the construction of Soviet Ukraine under Stalin. 
which came out as a monograph from the University of Toronto Press, uh, press in, in under the title Stalin's Empire of Memory. The Ukrainian translation of this book, published by Kritika, was selected by Ukrainian online, the uh, Ukrainian online newspaper Istorichna Pravda as one of the 100 most important history books in independent Ukraine, as was his sub subsequent 2010 book in Ukrainian on the Ukrainian files, The World of Ukrainian Patriots in the Second Half of the 19th Century. After spending a postdoctoral year at the University of Michigan, he accepted a position at the University of Victoria, where he is now a full professor. His appointment at the University of Victoria is split between the departments of history and, Germ and Germanic and Slavic studies, allowing uh, his cultural history approach to the Ukrainian class to flourish there. And I think uh, this is almost an understatement to say flourish for those of you who've been following all the activities at the University of, of Victoria. In fact, uh, due to the in, uh, his influence, as well as Olga Pre Prestich, who teaches Ukrainian language courses, the Department of Germanic and Russian Studies was renamed as Germanic and Slavic Studies. The Ukrainian community has established an endowment to support Ukrainian studies at the University of Victoria, to which the Petro Yatsik Education Foundation has made a sig significant contribution. Several named scholarships have been established in recent years to support the summer study program in KU, as well as the growing master's program in Ukrainian studies. He also holds an honorary appointment as affiliated professor of Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Washington. Professor Yakelchik is the author of seven books on modern Ukrainian history and culture, with the eighth and the ninth scheduled to be released in 2002. His monograph about post-war KU, Stalin Citizens, Everyday Politics in the, in the Wake of Total War, published by Oxford University Press in 2014, won the biannual book award from the American Association for Ukrainian Studies. And its Ukrainian translation, uh, which was published in 2018, won a special award at the Lviv Book Forum. His History of Ukraine, published first at Oxford University Press, was Choice Magazine's outstanding academic title in 2007 and went on to be translated into five languages. Its second edition is planned for 2023. Professor Yakelchik is associate editor of, of Harvard Ukrainian Studies and sits on the editorial boards of many journals in the field, including Kritika, Ab Imperio, and East West, the, our journal, the Institute's Journal of Ukrainian Studies. Since 2015, he has served as president of the Canadian Association for Ukrainian Studies. I might also add that he has contributed uh, tremendously to the study of the Ukrainian revolution or the Vizvolny Zvanya, depending on which way you, you would uh, choose to uh, label it. Today, he will turn to uh, a subject on Stalinism and related to the whole of the war but a topic I think uh, that also reflects his in interest in cultural studies. So I ask you to greet him for his lecture, not by starvation alone, Stalinist cultural genocide in Ukraine. Professor Yakelchik. Thank you very much for your introduction, Professor Sisson. It's my great pleasure to be giving this lecture uh, this year. I I hope that people joining us today from all corners of the world are thinking about the Holodomor, the Ukrainian genocide, and the new ways in which historians and cultural scores can contribute to the understanding of the enormity of this Ukrainian tragedy. It is true that the Holodomor is relatively well studied by now, but when one works on Soviet culture in Ukraine, one constantly ends up seeing new and new openings for the study of the most important Ukrainian event of the interwar period, the Holodomor. And even so, I never actually worked on starvation itself, on the social processes in the village, or the violent Stalinist transformation of the Ukrainian countryside and Ukrainian cities. I just 
couldn't do Soviet history in Ukraine without thinking it through and trying to understand for myself the nature of this tragedy. And so it happened that um, for all these years spent working on Ukrainian culture, including political culture during the Soviet period, the Holodomor was always an important presence in the background. The presence which I thought one day I would have to address. Also because, also because the theoretical, the conceptual understanding of the Holodomor was making important progress in those years. And due to the work of the scholars in Ukrainian diaspora and Professor Sisson, one of the preeminent scholars working on the Holodomor in Ukrainian diaspora and the role of diaspora as well, uh, the conceptual definition of the Ukrainian genocide and the understanding of the various components that constituted it is by now quite widespread and well accepted among Ukrainian scholars. We no longer understand the Holodomor as genocide only as famine, as the physical extermination of the Ukrainian peasantry, even so that was the most little and perhaps most important component of it. But what also made um, the Holodomor a genocide was the other aspects, the Stalinist attack on the Ukrainian nation, widely seen as represented by the peasants, by the uh, Ukrainian culture and by the national elites. And those national elites that developed in particular established a political position, established the idea of independent Ukraine in the course of the Ukrainian revolution of Izvolnys Mahanya. With them, I entered the area with which I was more familiar. The period of the Ukrainian revolution and the reimagined Soviet Ukraine under Stalin. That was the subject of my first book in English, actually. And when, um, after thinking it through, I realized that we do have some very interesting um, conceptual innovations there, but there are also innovations that are so recent that they have not yet been processed by Ukrainian historians and specialists on Ukrainian culture. We live now in the world in which the notions of decolonization and cultural genocide are increasingly applied and used in mass culture. They provide scholars with new instruments that allow us to better understand the cultural dimension of the genocide and also more generally the nature of Soviet policies in Ukraine. And I will explain in a minute what I mean here. Um, already Raphael Lemkin stressed even so that even so the 1948 definition of genocide as, as accepted by the United Nations basically focused on physically harming the nation. But Lenkin in his own work um, around the same time and specifically on Ukraine emphasized also the cultural aspect. He formulated it in a somewhat metaphorical way speaking of the uh, soul of the nation and the brain of the nation. And it never really was accepted by historians at that time. Uh, some of the data he was using back then uh, was not also very reliable, but the very principle, the very principle direction of research that Lemkin indicated in the early 1950s was promising. And it is in fact unfortunate that it was not fully developed in subsequent decades. Because what he had in mind was actually the damage done to a national culture. And of course, we can understand the damage in a very direct and physical way, the way Lemkin also understood it, the destruction of national heritage. Uh, he also speaks of the attack on the national culture, which leads to basically uh, the extermination of national culture, the spiritual extermination of the nation. And these things, are very, very relevant for the discussion of Stalinist politics. But they need to be fine-tuned now with our better understanding and better access to the archives, which Lemkin unfortunately lacked. Um, with this new con concepts and the new archival sources, we can perhaps um, advance 
the notion of the Ukrainian genocide, the Holodomor of the Ukrainian genocide, to make it even more relevant for today's world by indicating the nature of the Stalinist attack on Ukrainian culture. And why we need to do this? Because as 21st century historians who can go into the archives, and of course in Ukraine, which is wonderful, um, all the archives are open and you can, you can go into the most secret uh, files of the Politburo of the Ukrainian Communist Party, you can go into the KGB and KVD archives, you have access to them. Um, in Ukraine in particular, the Stalinist cultural policy was very often ambivalent and changing. And we cannot really say uh, the way Lemkin was uh, discussing it in the early 1950s, that Stalinism aimed to destroy Ukrainian culture altogether. That's not quite true. Stalin's design was even worse, actually, because if you start destroying the culture in an obvious way, then that would, would perhaps be seen immediately as attack on humanity itself. But Stalinist design was more complex. It was the destruction of traditional Ukrainian culture and the new Ukrainian elites, which developed during the revolution. But in place of these, Stalin wanted to create a Ukrainian culture of the new type. And so he did. And we now can prove uh, that he personally supervised the creation of this Ukrainian culture of the new type, a culture which would be subservient, uh, in which the uh, cultural figures would be scared, constantly fearing for their lives, and trying to please the leader, as well as trying to please Moscow. And nevertheless, it was a variety of Ukrainian culture which existed under the conditions of colonial exploitation. And here we arrive to the point of cultural studies today, understanding colonialism in a more sophisticated way than was, it was the case in the 1930s and 50s. Today, when we speak about post-colonial theory and the notion of colonialism, we don't need to argue whether or not Soviet Ukraine was a colony of the Soviet Union and Russia. What we can say is that the very approach of Ukrainian cultural figures at the time and the very political signals left for cultural figures indicate to us that it was an unequal and hierarchical colonial relationship with the Moscow center. And of course, the, these days, the post-colonial complex of some Ukrainian intellectuals is yet another evidence that these relations were in their nature similar to the ones you would encounter in classical empires and classical colonies. So now when we arm ourselves with the understanding that uh, cultural genocide does not necessarily mean complete extermination of culture and full assimilation of the people. Also that uh, probably was an aim at some later point, and I will um, talk about it during the post-war period in particular. Once we understood that cultural um, genocide, the way it is used today in Canada and around the world, and it is now widely applied to the case of Irish culture, and of course to the cultures of, um, of uh, the First Nations in North America. They were not, of course, exterminated completely. And the cultural presence continued. Like here in British Columbia, nobody ever destroyed all the totem poles, for instance but they became a part of museified, ethnographic, safe culture. But then we might ask the question, isn't it really the same as the Sharovarshina under Stalin, where the dancing companies and singing Ukrainians were allowed and very welcome, but any political will, any political sovereignty of Ukraine was completely suppressed and with it, a number of the strands in Ukrainian culture, which would not fit in such a safe ethnographic uh, presentation mode. It almost feels like these companies actually existed for the occasions when they would go to Moscow and perform in the Kremlin, demonstrating that Ukrainian culture does exist for the dictator. <laughs> 
right? And so when we think of Ukrainian culture in these terms, we realize that, well, um, Stalin definitely wanted to destroy Ukrainian culture. But in doing so, he also wanted to build a new Ukrainian culture, a Stalinist Ukrainian culture, the one in which um, he would create um, the Virsky Dancing Company, the Veryovka National Choir, um, and a number of other institutions. Um, in, and subsequently the Bandura uh, Traveling Company, all kinds of things created by the Soviet state in Stalin's name as kind of formal trappings of Ukrainian culture, but they would be limited to certain niche. And here we arrive to another notion which we need to address here. I've just said that Sharovarshina, you know, the baggy trousers of dancing and singing Ukrainians who only dance and sing, but they don't actually define the nation politically. They do not fight uh, the imperial oppressor are equally acceptable in Imperial Russia. Of course, we know now from most recent research that even some um, Russian monarchists felt that Taras Shevchenko was a great poet, but he was not a poet of Ukraine. He was a poet of that particular region of Imperial Russia uh, in which struggle with Poland was important. So we do know that the little Russian identity and the most loyal little Russian identity, even in its monarchist form, did exist in Imperial Russia. And so what, what emerges here is a very interesting question of uh, whether we can compare Stalinist cultural policies in Ukraine with those pursued by Imperial Russia. And there are actually some very interesting parallels. Uh, perhaps the one which I need to start with, the most important one, has to do with the notion of a modern Ukrainian identity and a niche culture. So we all know that in 1863, a special uh, circular letter uh, in the Russian Empire banned the publication of textbooks and books for the common readers, for the general public in Ukrainian and religious books. So what was the purpose there? Scholars today think that the issue was not manipulating the Ukrainian peasantry. The peasants were left in the open place. They spoke Ukrainian, but the problem was to limit the access of the Ukrainian intelligentsia to the peasantry, because that contact would produce a modern Ukrainian identity. So the Russian empire obviously then worried not, not so much about the peasants as of, of the possibility of a modern Ukrainian identity manifesting itself. And that is precisely the moment when the gendarmes would go into action and start arresting members of Ukrainian parties and those who tried to reach out to the peasantry. But that actually would be very similar to the logic of the culture Stalin wanted to build in Ukraine after he destroyed, decimated, and to a significant degree destroyed the old Ukrainian intelligentsia because it was not a culture of modern Ukraine in which all the modern Ukrainians would be supposed to speak Ukrainian and politically identify with the Ukrainian idea. But rather, it was a kind of a niche culture in which the peasants can continue speaking Ukrainian. But in the cities, in the cities, speaking Ukrainian would become a statement unless, unless the speaker was in the niche um, of Ukrainian scholarship or culture and professionally engaged and expected to speak Ukrainian. So this niche culture, all of us would be very familiar with. If you ever visited the Soviet Union, I've heard stories about the lives there and I was growing up um, in that state. That's precisely the kind of niche culture with the ethnographic exhibition allowed with singing and dancing but the moment you started speaking Ukrainian in an unexpected setting in the city, you were immediately becoming suspect. And that in itself is a colonial situation. This is also a situation of cultural genocide in which a culture is artificially limited to certain niche, um, to a niche of professional, professional Ukrainian studies specialists, and also to the niche of safe 
ethnographic representational mode, museum and singing and dancing Ukrainians. Now, this particular type of Ukrainian culture was created at the same time as the Holodomor. And here, it's not, of course, a coincidence. It's part of the plan because as Stalin was destroying the, destroying the Ukrainian culture, the previous Ukrainian culture, the culture informed by the notions of nationhood, identity, and political rights, he was also creating a new culture, a culture in which the nation would have only token representation and only token rights. So, um, for instance, if you consider the um, very interesting moment in the history of the Soviet Ukrainian Republic when writers are suddenly being promoted to high positions in the government. Techina becomes the Minister of Education, uh, Kornichuk, um, Rilsky acquires important positions in the Academy of Sciences, Kornichuk is first considered uh, for, for the chairman, actually Dovzhenko is first considered for the chairman of the parliament, Kornichuk becomes Minister of Internal Affairs, what is it supposed to mean? If Stalin has just spent time before that killing Ukrainian writers. But this is, of course, yet another manifestation of that precise transformation, not just in Ukrainian culture, but also in the very notion, the very concept of Ukrainian nationhood. By promoting the writers who clearly are not qualified, Stalin wants to make it look like Ukrainians are in charge of their own republic. And on the other hand, the writers serve as a token representatives of the Ukrainian nation. They must be there because they represent the people, but they also represent the people in a safe and ethnographic mode. And they are also the generation scared for life by terror. And of course, those who knew Techina and Rilsky in post four years would speak of how deeply traumatized they were. And the Techina in particular was pushed to, um, uh, to a very um, well pronounced servility, constantly praising the regime and looking in the word, words of one writer, looking as if he stepped on some, somebody's uh, foot and wanted to apologize, but he constantly wanted to apologize to somebody. And of course, we also know that um, Techina had uh, subsequently a uh, close relationship with Oles Hanchar, a member of the younger generation. And when he died, Techina's widow would tell Hanchar that Techina would sometimes wake up at night and tell me, he, meaning Hanchar, needs to be more careful. He really needs to be more careful because he is really on edge meaning that he can be arrested tomorrow. And so this generation of the scared, the generation of survivors also now needed to represent not the Ukrainian culture itself, but Ukrainian statehood as well, because the nature of Ukrainian statehood was also basically an ethnographic curiosity now, just in the same way as the type of Ukrainian culture produced under Stalin. And so in this way then, there are multiple connections between what we see in Imperial Russia and what we see under Stalin. And uh, first of all, let's start with the Ukrainian revolution with Nacionalno Vizvolny Zmohanya. I think it's very clear to any student of this period that the Bolsheviks were targeting precisely modern Ukrainians, not the peasants, who were not enlightened perhaps by the concept of nationhood, but did speak Ukrainian and observed ethnographic customs. But the urbanites who were conscious Ukrainians and those who carried identification in uh, Ukrainian, issued in Ukrainian. Subsequently, all kinds of explanations were offered for that by the uh, Bolsheviks in Ukraine. Um, Zatonsky famously wrote that, or infamously perhaps wrote, that those people who in 1919 wanted to kill all Ukrainians on sight on the street, objectively and historically were the same people who would build a new Soviet Ukraine and contribute to the development of Ukrainian culture. And I think he really revealed a bit more in this sentence than he intended to. He intended to say one thing, but he actually confessed 
do something else without realizing it. And when we look at the conflicts of this period, it is extremely clear that Bolsheviks understand the Ukrainian question as the peasant question. And they want to deal with the peasants directly. They do not want this intermediary at first, the Ukrainian intelligence, but subsequently they are pushed into accepting an intermediary. And this is the Ukrainian Borodists who are accepted into the Communist Party as, as a large group and subsequently provide some cover and provide um, the connection between the Bolsheviks and the peasantry to the degree it was possible given the politics. But generally, there is the moment in which you see that the cruel policies of grain requisitioning go hand in hand with the extermination, killing, and arrests of Ukrainian political activists and cultural figures. As soon as the Bolsheviks establish their control of Ukraine by 1921, 23, depending on how you measure it, there's also a series of political trials which came to light only recently. They were forgotten, um, unjustifiably so, because they really indicated the future direction. And what, what becomes transparent in those trials, particularly in the trial of the Ukrainian Party of Socialist Revolutionaries, which was held in 1921, and subsequent trials of uh, Kiev Oblast Center and such, was that the Ukrainian intelligentsia was being blamed for peasant insurgency. The connection here is very telling. This connection is precisely the one which is going to inform Stalin's thinking about the famine and the instrumental use of the famine and the connection of Ukrainian intelligentsia to the Ukrainian peasantry. So they are put on trial in order, in order to create, to make obvious the responsibility of Ukrainian intellectuals for the behavior of the Ukrainian peasantry, to accuse Ukrainian intellectuals of being the leaders of the peasantry. Even so, in reality, I very much as a historian doubt that there was a strong connection uh, between the representatives of Ukrainian intellectual circles in Kiev and Kharkiv and the peasant insurgency. The peasant insurgency did acquire an important political dimension. The idea of the UNR was perhaps more important to the peasantry at this time than it was important when the UNR uh, still existed. But, but the intellectuals were not really engaged in this kind of political work. And yet the Bolsheviks want to make this connection. And they do, because they now understand the Ukrainian cultural activities as constituting political danger. So this connection then is established already in 1919 and going forward into the early 1920s. So ever since the secret police in Ukraine, the uh, various incarnations of uh, Soviet secret police keep a close watch over Ukrainian intellectuals and from time to time arrest them and um, organize trials. But this comes to an end in 1924. And of course, when you think about the year 1924, or maybe perhaps 1923 and going into 1924, it's an interesting year. It's a year of transition, uh, in a sense of transition to the policy of Ukrainization, and also transition to acceptance of the peasant autonomy over the issue of the grain. When the authorities in the entire Soviet Union really uh, proceed from the policy of violence and requisitioning to a period which is going to last for much of the 1920s of kind of uneasy balance with the peasantry, of tolerating the peasants for now, recognizing that the peasants have power and waiting for it. And so interestingly enough, it becomes not really important during this period for the Bolsheviks to put on trial the Ukrainian intellectuals. Once we look at what the secret police is doing, the secret police continues to watch very closely over Ukrainian uh, intelligentsia. And in fact, um, especially, especially 
beginning in 1925 and going into 1926. But during this period, there are no major show trials and there are no accusations of a connection, of a criminal connection between the peasant rebels against the Soviet rule and Ukrainian uh, cultural figures. But at the same time, this is precisely the period when there are important cultural debates, the literary discussion in Ukraine, um, when uh, Ukrainian literary and government figures actually raise the issue of Ukraine's colonial status, interpret Ukrainization as an anti-colonial project. And actually, if you think of Ukrainization now uh, in terms of decolonization, as we understand it today, this is very much a decolonization project because the party is forced to acknowledge that great Russian nationalism is a bigger danger because it is connected to imperial uh, hierarchy. And so for now, for now, the party considers the nationalism of minorities in the Soviet Union, here meaning Ukrainians as well, even so they are majority in the old Republic, that this is a smaller danger because it is derivative. It is a result of the Russian great power chauvinism. So this theory, of course, remains in force until 1933. And as you realize now, so many things are coming together in 1933 to show to us that it's actually not a few aspects, but the entire direction of Stalinist policy uh, is in 1933 to come down hard on the Ukrainian resistance resistance in various ways, both peasant, uh, peasant resistance and the intellectual trends which see the Russian rule as colonial rule and the process of Ukrainization as decolonization. There are a few things I need to mention here. In 1926, two major developments, Stalin's letter to Kaganovich and other members of the Ukrainian leadership in connection with that conversation Alexander Shumsky, then the Ukrainian Minister of Culture, former Borodbist, had with Stalin. It was a long conversation and Stalin's letter is a belated answer uh, to it, but it's a very interesting answer. Of course, Shumsky's point was, as many of you probably know, that by 1926, Soviet Ukraine is sufficiently strong to produce its own leadership. There is no point for Moscow to be sending uh, representatives to Ukraine who are not ethnic Ukrainians. He in particular proposes replacing the party secretary in Ukraine, the head of Ukrainian government, moving people around basically uh, to make this decolonization project consistent, coherent, extending all the way to the top. But Stalin gets really upset with this proposal. And in his answer, he doesn't really focus on the issue of leadership, curiously enough. But instead, he says, the biggest issue which Comrade Shumsky misunderstands is the issue of the working class. Uh, and on the issue of the working class, it is impossible to demand the Ukrainization of Russian workers. Now, Stalin is slightly playing with words here because nobody really demands the Ukrainization of Russian workers, but the Ukrainization of a Russified, of assimilated Ukrainian workers. But Stalin's point is that the moment when you start demanding that urban workers switch to Ukrainian culture, that moment you are making an assault on something terribly important. The letter says, it could become a struggle against Moscow more generally against the Russians more generally, against the Russian culture and its highest achievement, Leninism. So these demands are completely unacceptable. This is the moment when an important signal is sent. Uh, Stalin actually goes on to, to develop this idea that Ukrainian um, intelligentsia and Ukrainian leadership needs to understand that a new Ukrainian culture can be Soviet only if it fights against such extreme proposals. So a Soviet Ukrainian culture then should not challenge the Russian cultural domination. Interestingly enough, Stalin says pretty clearly here what he is going to start enforcing in the 1930s. This is 1926. 
In the same year, 1926, the secret police in Ukraine publishes um, a memorandum, kind of a small booklet, which would be sent to various local branches to inform them about most recent uh, developments. And it is, of course, in Russian, not surprisingly. And it's called On Ukrainian Separatism. And the name immediately starts resonating because historians would immediately think back to 1912 and to Shogolev's book about the South Russian uh, separatism, uh, about the Ukrainian uh, movement as part of South Russian separatism. So it's the same language, actually the same language Russian and the same terminology used by the Tsarist government, because the Tsarist government would actually speak of separatism. And this, um, this uh, informational letter has some very interesting signals for the future, which are not necessarily picked up at the time. It's basically a secret as well. It mentions the tactics of cultural struggle against the Soviet power. It actually explains that the Ukrainian counter-revolution, quote unquote, was defeated. And for now, it switched to the tactics of cultural struggle. It uses Ukrainization. It makes the most important, um, it, it makes most important emphasis on the rural well-to-do peasants, the kulaks. And the recommendation number three in this brochure is to connect the work, or secret police's work, on the Ukrainian intelligentsia and that with the work on the village. This is 1926. And it's perfectly obvious at this point for the leadership of Stalinist secret police in Ukraine that these two things have to come together because they define the nature of Ukrainian nationhood, quite simply. They make Ukraine more than just ethnographic safe niche. So once, once the intelligentsia is with the peasantry, it can create Ukrainian statehood. And so this work then continues, but it remains invisible. It remains invisible. It remains invisible for quite a while, actually, until, until the affair of the uh, Union for Liberation of Ukraine, which we all know was a staged trial in Kharkiv in 1930 and uh, an important moment of defining what Soviet culture would be. But what is not usually emphasized, but clearly visible in the archives, also I have to say that the full archive of this particular investigation and trial comprises 237 thick volumes. So it's, it's a big undertaking to go through it. But uh, one thing which stood out for me in looking at, at the preparations for the trial was that um, the secret police wanted to create a pedigree for those put on trial. These people were usually connected to the Ukrainian revolution. So it was after all a trial of those connected to the Ukrainian uh, National Republic and the Ukrainian uh, at uh, uh, Orthodox Church, but there is more to that. Um, technically, the secret police insisted that the Union for the Liberation of Ukraine was created in 1926. But before that, the members of the union allegedly participated in the previous organization, which was called the Brotherhood of Ukrainian Statehood, Bratstvo Ukrainskoy Dzerzhavnosti, which allegedly existed between 1920 and 24. Why was it important for Stalinist secret police to make sure that the resistance existed back then? Because that would connect them to the peasant uh, rebellions of the early 1920s to a massive wave of insurgency in Ukraine. And this is indeed uh, what the prosecution side argues, that the Brotherhood, um, the Brotherhood controlled and developed the Kurkulski diversini banditism, like kind of the kulak and sabotage in the Ukrainian countryside, but they were not caught back then. What it means is that the, the connection between the Ukrainian peasants and the Ukrainian intelligentsia was never interrupted. So the intelligentsia allegedly, according to Stalinist secret police, always continued this line of encouraging the rebellions 
of the peasant trade. And now, of course, I would like to uh, share my screen for a second and to show you two things that are now possible for those working with the secret police archives in Ukraine. Um, let me try share screen. All right. So yeah, as you see, this is the website of the electronic archive of the Ukrainian liberation movement. Um, there was a long period when historians working on Stalinist cultural repression were trying to publish documents volume by volume, but they or we soon realize that you're going to run out of volumes. And most recently, especially in connection with, uh, with the Russian aggression and the need to counter the Russian interpretation of Stalinism, this important project um, put online for now the most significant documents of the cultural repression. Um, this is actually not what I wanted to see. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you can you can get here the reports of uh, secret informers. You can also get here uh, the uh, prosecution side formulation of uh, what the crime, what constituted the crime. And here there are two things that are really striking for me as a historian. One is that there is always a line or two and sometimes a page or two about the famine and the situation in the countryside. Even so, that was not usually the main accusation. The secret police collected the information about what the writers, what the Ukrainian writers say about the situation in the countryside. And here we see Kosinka also spoke about the situation in the countryside. This is 1934 about the famine coming up again, which could be the same as last year. And, and the situation in collective farms is terrible and such, and he goes on and on and on about that. And you know, um, in, in, in Stalinist documents and in this informant's reports, um, there are things that are clearly unbelievable. And there are things that are kind of even ridiculous, really. But that conversations are constantly referring to the situation on the countryside and the famine is actually the believable part of it because this is what we get in the memoirs of those who lived uh, through this period, who left for the West during World War II or survived the Stalinist camps. We know that uh, Volodymyr Sosura, one of the greatest Ukrainian poets at the time, said that the famine was the reason why he ended up in a mental hospital or one of the important reasons why that happened. We know that the writers had were supposed to describe the socialist transformation of the countryside, but what was in fact happening in the countryside was the opposite. And now, of course, it also gives you the collections, it gives you names of organizations, um, and then you can click, uh, you can click on, on, on those names or events and and uh, perhaps uh, personal names is actually usually a good way of going around it. And with a number of documents available now, you can also select just to see the first page or to see the entire document. Here's whether it's the first page or, or you go here to see the entire document. And then you get the entire report in this particular case. And then you get also the mention of the Galicians. And this is a second striking thing. Because uh, when these people are executed, they usually execute it on the charges of something of really ground, like conspiring to kill Stalin and his representatives in Ukraine. And this is clearly one of those Stalinist things that you must blame them of that. But the two topics constantly coming up is the peasantry and the Ukrainians outside of Soviet Ukraine. And both I think are really important for our understanding of what constitutes Ukrainian nation. 
during this period. Um, of course, the entire project of the Soviet Ukraine is defined as a project against the Ukrainian immigration, against the so-called Petlurite, Petlurivska in Gratia, but also against Galicina, because one of the big motives for the Ukrainization is, in fact, to project Soviet Ukraine as a place where Galicians could, in fact, emigrate, and some of them did. And most of them ended up uh, dying there and being arrested and, and killed and such, imprisoned. But to create a Soviet Ukraine, which would be attractive for the Ukrainian diaspora. And this continues until, again, the same period, until 1933. Until 1933, um, it seems that Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian secret police want to engage with Ukrainians abroad. After 1933, for a variety of reasons, the collapse of support of uh, the Communist Party of Western Ukraine, the famine itself, the Holodomor, the support there collapses. And then this connection to the diaspora, this connection to Holochina becomes a dangerous connection, the one which serves as a basis of accusation of arrests. And as you probably know, uh, all those, almost all those Galicians um, who were either, who either stayed in Soviet Ukraine um, in 1920-21, kind of, uh, they are from, from the Galician army, from the part of the Galician army which served, served the Bolsheviks and they subsequently stayed, or they immigrated during the 1920s or the 1930s. Krushelnitsky, Hrushevsky, uh, Hrushevsky, of course, is not Galician, but the, the, this entire emigration which comes, which comes, which comes to, to Soviet Ukraine is going to suffer. They are going to be made the most important enemies. And the logic for this is, of course, obvious, but it's very interesting, isn't it? They are kind of the representatives of a united Ukrainian nation. They are the representatives of the idea that there should be a united Ukrainian state. So in the 1920s, the Soviets actually like this notion because it means that they are going to get a chance to extend their borders, that they would seduce uh, the Ukrainians abroad uh, with the notion of Ukrainization. But in the 1930s, it becomes a liability. And this actually also explains an attack on Ukrainian culture in a very important way. And there's a, a parallel here with what happens with Jewish culture in the Soviet Union, a very interesting parallel. Because as we, as we know, um, in the late 1940s and going into the 1950s, there is really a cultural genocide of Jewish culture in the Soviet Union. And there's a massive attack on Jewish cultural organizations, executions of prominent representatives and such. And there, it actually is informed by the very same logic. Up until the creation of the state of Israel, it's good to have contacts with foreign Jews because these contacts are going to bring millions for the Soviet state and support in the war. Once there is a state of Israel abroad, then being a Soviet Jew suddenly becomes very suspicious situation. But of course, if we apply this argument to Ukraine, which as you see is really important in terms of Galicia being seen from 1933 as a terrible place, really, really uh, dangerous place, the place which would need to be controlled rather than the place from which people could come to Soviet Ukraine. This parallel would actually take us in a very interesting direction. Um, Khrushchev famously wrote in his memoirs, and he, I think, claimed it at one of the party congresses, uh, that Stalin had wanted, had wanted to relocate all the Ukrainians, to exile all of them. But there were too many of them, nowhere to put them. And I think what is actually meant here is most likely not all the Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians, which were now seen as representing that idea of a united Ukraine, of Galicians, of Western Ukrainians. There's also a very interesting episode when uh, Sikorsky, uh, Polish, the Polish uh, government uh, representative, arrives in the Soviet Union during the war. 
and speaks to Stalin about what will happen to Lviv. Um, and Stalin agrees with him, and there is actually a record uh, maintained by the Polish delegation of this conversation that, uh, well, the problem is the Ukrainians over there, the Galician Ukrainians. And Stalin actually says, we will, we will exterminate them together with you, together with the Poles. And it's difficult to see what was what was actually mentioned, what was a metaphor, what was a way of engaging the Polish um, visiting dignitary. But it does seem like the policies that would develop after the war, when the Soviet authorities are finally acquiring and the so-called second Soviet occupation, Druhi Soviete, when they arrive in Western Ukraine, but the policies there become perhaps an even more concentrated example of cultural genocide. And we do not often think of the second Soviet occupation of the Soviet uh, control of, uh, of Western Ukraine after the war as a continuation of the Holodomor. And yet it was in a very important and meaningful way. It was also collectivization, which produced massive resistance, which fueled the Ukrainian insurgency. It was also the elimination of the national church. And it was also very importantly, Russification, assimilation attempt, which basically resulted in, as scholars have shown, as my colleague Andrei Zayarnyuk has uh, shown, that Lviv in the 1940s had the same um, ethnic composition as the city of Dnipropetrovsk in eastern Ukraine. And Lviv was well known, was in fact in the late 1940s predominantly a Russian speaking city. The fact that even very Soviet writers protested that you could use on a, a tram, tram stop the indication of the city car uh, direction. Uh, you could say Zaliznichny uh, district in Kiev, in Ukrainian, but in, in, in Lviv it was to be spelled in Russian. And so, uh, when we look at it as a continuation of cultural genocide, it makes perfect sense and actually it does not stop there. But I have to, but I have to jump. Okay, actually, I wanted to show you one more very interesting thing here. Um, here it is. It's a digital publication. Sergey, we thing. cannot see. We cannot see because we see just only one document always. Okay, got it. All right, so I have to close that, right? Okay, let me close that. What would happen if I close that? Now, how about now? You can actually have to go to share screen and every time when you actually choose, you need to choose a new document. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah. New share, right? Okay, how about now? It's good. Good, okay. So it's a digital publication and publication of a new type, which is becoming reality in Ukraine as well as around the world now, uh, which allows you, as you see, it has a, a QR code and it has embedded links there as well. Where, uh, what it is, is actually biographies of uh, most important Ukrainian intellectuals of the 1920s, which give you examples, explain what was in fact happening with them, who was arrested on what on what charges, and you can go to the document as well, to the document itself. So Koist Burevi here, um, and, and once you click on it, it, it leads you to the same site where which we have just, which we have just visited. I wouldn't want to open too many pages here. Um, so, and it leads you to the document and then you can look at the document itself. All right, okay, now I stop sharing and talk, talk a little bit more. So uh, what we see in these documents, what we see in these documents is the connection to diaspora represented in the first place by Galicia, Western Ukraine, and subsequently by Ukrainians abroad. Uh, there are actually references to Canada, and um, one prominent Ukrainian writer, 
uh, Ivan Kulik, who is actually on the Soviet side. He is the enforcer of Stalinist ideology in the writer's circles. Um, the, the real name is uh, Israel, but uh, um, he's Jewish, but he's a Ukrainian, a Ukrainian speaking writer who has a rather unpleasant role in the 1930s because he enforces those interpretations. Um, he, he argues that he was in fact, uh, well, he visited Canada and Miroslav Erchan was an important agent of Ukrainian nationalists in Canada. And he put him in touch with some members, Ukrainian members of the Communist Party of Canada who were also in, in reality nationalists. So there is a Canadian context, but what it, only tells us is that it is important for Stalinist secret police to connect a cultural figure to that other Ukraine which exists there because it is potentially threatening, it is a threat to the Soviet project. And of course the famine, the Holodomor, is what connects all the dots here because when um, Mike Johansson is arrested, a prominent Ukrainian literary figure of the 1920s. Uh, they also interrogate him, asking questions about who, who talked about the countryside. What did you say about countryside? And if you, if you go through the same way I've just shown you through this digital publication to the straight to the archival document, Johansson says, well, in 1932, I had a number of conversations with Kulish who told me that in Ukraine, the famine is deliberately created with the aim of exterminating the Ukrainian population. And the true Ukrainians need to fight against the measures of the Soviet power. So interestingly enough, that connection which will take many decades to make for us, the historians, was fairly obvious for Stalinist investigators. They wanted to connect the notion of the genocide, the famine as a genocidal famine, to the Ukrainian intelligentsia. You get this also at various other places. Rechitsky tells the informant that he was traveling to the village um, with on, on the project of literally pumping out bread. And that the situation of the peasants is terrible. And he did this job in desperation, being frightened. But of course, what ideally the Stalinist investigators want to find is the direct connection to the village. And they do get some of the investigated confess to that. Grigory Epic in particular confesses that uh, the, the, there were underground cells created in the villages. And this connection then doesn't have to be proven. In most cases, the name of the peasant is not even given, but it's part of the accusation against the Ukrainian intelligentsia that they tried to connect with the peasantry. And what you realize right away, of course, that the trial of the Union for Liberation of Ukraine begins in the same year as massive peasant rebellions around Ukraine. So here then, this connection is stressed over and over again. So the one which was established during the revolution, now when the peasants are resisting Stalinist collectivization, they must be connected to Ukrainian nationalism. And this is the connection in, Stalin mind, in Stalin's mind, which is shown by historians using various other documents, in particular about the Ukrainization in, in the areas of the Russian Republic and the distinction between so, the so-called Petlurite Ukrainization and the, the real good Soviet Ukrainization. Sergei Efremov, in July 1929, about to be arrested, and to become the principal figure in the process of the Union for the Liberation of Ukraine. 2nd of July, terrible news from the villages, terror, stealing. Nobody understands what's going on. They are destroying the kurkul, the wealthy peasant, but in reality, destroying the 
any dobrobut, kind of any well-being of the peasants. This is a sadistic insanity, writes Yefremov. And of course, this becomes subsequently part of his criminal case. And now, let us go forward a little bit and see what, what is happening in subsequent years. One important difference between the early 1930s and the late 1930s is that in the late 1930s, you do not usually get specific Ukrainian organizations invented by the NKVD. You do get them in the early 1930s, starting with Ukrainian military organization and actually the Association of Ukrainian Nationalists, which also abbreviates as OUN um, and claims to have connection to, to, to OUN, but it's not, not the same organization at all. Um, and you get the Ukrainian National Center and other, other such things, but not in the late 1930s. In the late 1930s, these people are, are processed by the system on, on political charges of having been members of other parties, allegedly supporting the Trotskyist bloc and such. That's one interesting difference here. It sort of indicates that the secret police is still working with the Ukrainian intelligentsia, but doesn't want um, to emphasize its importance anymore. Kind of, it really wants to emphasize its importance in the early 1930s, but not in the late 1930s. Um, now, there is a certain degree of randomness to that terror against the intelligentsia. So it is well known uh, that Vasil Misik was arrested instead of Vasil Menko because the um, NKVD officers basically got confused. They arrived at a different uh, floor of this slower building in Kharkiv and arrested the wrong person. Um, but of course, he ended up being processed by the system and going into the gulag and they never came back to arrest the right person, which indicates that, of course, they realized that they were inventing all kinds of organizations and any name could fit there because all the Ukrainian writers who uh, developed in the atmosphere of this decolonization drive of the 1920s would be guilty by Stalinist standards. So this uh, randomness, and then the interesting, interesting uh, changes going into the mid 1930s. Um, in 1933, Andrei Khvile, who is the cultural boss in the party central committee in Ukraine, actually says that Kobza and Bandura are, are instruments of class enemy, the musical instruments of class enemy. But interestingly enough, interestingly enough, it only takes about two years, 1934-35, when the Bandura, Bandura company in Ukraine, the, the main, the national Bandura company is not operational. And those surviving members uh, work with a Capella Dumka, with, with the choir. But starting in 1936 and going in subsequent years, the Bandura company is restored, receives an eventually national status in 1946. And it's actually a good indication of what is going on there. So first you have to crush the Ukrainian culture and then you create a different new Ukrainian culture. So when Western Ukraine is incorporated in 1939, one of the first things that happens there is that the Bandura company from Stalinist Ukraine arrives to give a concert. And of course this concert is going to feature Stalinist, good Stalinist songs. So it is, from a formal point of view, it looks the same, but it's definitely not the same. Okay, and then the we I often assume we often assume that um, the arrests of Ukrainian intelligence and the executions of 1933 and 34 led directly to the abandonment of Ukrainization as policy, and this is true to a degree because. Nobody wanted to be active in Ukrainization drive at this point because everybody realized that is the recipe to get arrested. Also, some of these people get executed already in 1937 in the second wave when they're already in the camps. But it's actually interesting to know that the term Ukrainization is not outlawed at all. It continues to exist in official speeches and in party newspapers. So in order to emphasize that that was the wrong Ukrainization, 
the Petlurite Ukrainization, which had the political overtones and was connected to peasant rebellions, after the peasantry is crushed and the Ukrainian intelligentsia is crushed, the state has to continue for several years talking about the Ukrainization now being correct. And this is actually the period 1934-37. But then, but then Nikita Khrushchev comes to Ukraine, and this is one of little known pages of his activities. He actually comes as a major assimilator, as a Russification drive begins with Khrushchev. And with his arrival in January, February 1938, the very notion of Ukrainization is dropped from the public discourse. Interestingly enough, if you read Khrushchev's memoirs, he says that he was reluctant to go to Ukraine, perhaps for, for the reasons connected to Ukrainization precisely. He tried to argue to Stalin, or so he says, that he couldn't give a speech in Ukraine. But Stalin smiled and said, no, it's OK. You can go now. Right? And that's also a very telling political move that now, in the late 1930s, it's perfectly fine to appoint a party boss in Ukraine who cannot even speak Ukrainian at all. And who is barely literal, as far as we know. He, he was trying not to leave any notes written in his own hand, instead dictated to various aides. And so what then is the outcome of the genocide involving cultural genocide as well, but with cultural genocide extending over the period of the war and into the late Soviet period? It's actually a very important page of our history, which is only now begins to be studied. Because there is definitely a drive to organize a full-blown cultural genocide. That church is being blown up, artifacts uh, from Ukrainian museums taken to Russia, uh, legacy actually being physically destroyed, and as you see, being, of course, destroyed in spiritual sphere as well. Khrushchev arrives in 1938 with the agenda of immediately um, promoting the importance of studying Russian at school. Even before he arrives, actually, Stalin sends a telegram about that. Please report what is, what is the situation with teaching Russian at school. But this is not what happens. Um, because in 1939, the Stalinist Incorporation of Western Ukraine proceeds under a slogan of uniting Ukraine within the Soviet state. And that forces the Soviet authorities to go back to the rhetoric they thought they would never use. From 1936, there's a notion in the Soviet Union of the great Russian nation, which is the leading nation of the Soviet Union. However, in 1939, it is permitted to add to it a second great nation, the Ukrainian nation. Um, lots of people know about Stalin's address to the population in July 1941 with the beginning of the Nazi-Soviet conflict. Uh, very few of us know about Khrushchev's address to the population of Ukraine on that very occasion, the start of that particular war. And Khrushchev actually starts by saying, sons and daughters of the great Ukrainian people. So he who arrived, who arrived uh, to Ukraine as an assimilator, who didn't even speak Ukrainian, is forced by Stalinist geopolitical designs uh, to justify the acquisition of Western Ukraine and to keep appealing to the Ukrainian national sentiment throughout the war, with the creation of the Medal of Bogdan Khmelnytsky and all kinds of other things. And then what happens to the continuation of cultural genocide in Western Ukraine? And I said that the post-war period is perhaps the clearest example of what cultural genocide really is, when over 30,000 teachers are sent into Western Ukraine from Stalinist Ukraine and from Russia directly. That's a full-scale replacement of the teaching cadre, really, as such. Um, the dis destruction of the church, all kinds of other things. And this does not last, interestingly enough. Um, once in the 70s, uh, Roman Sporluk published an interesting article about uh, comparing Belarus and Ukraine in terms of social communication. Social communication is, of course, back then the term for 
uh, the newspapers primarily, but also um, uh, radio and television. And he noticed an important difference between Western Ukraine and Western Belarus in that after the war, uh, the Soviets actually completely Russify Western Belarus. They impose the Russian language, the Russian media, and we all know the consequences. But they do not do this in Western Ukraine. They try, but there is actual resistance which goes beyond the hardest year of collectivization, 1947. And at some point, at some point, the Soviet authorities take the view that uh, they need to make a concession to this particular region of Ukraine, which is seen, I, I bet, as a temporary concession, but this is what it is, allowing the existence of Ukrainian media and the functioning of Ukrainian language um, at schools, uh, at universities. And by the way, by the time this decision is taken around 1950, most colleges in Western Ukraine offer instruction predominantly in Russian, a well forgotten page of, uh, of the Soviet rule in that region. But when the media in Ukrainian is allowed to exist, this creates institutional structure for the new generation of Ukrainian village youth who is going to arrive to the cities in the region in the 1950s and 60s and completely change the character of Lviv and other cities in Western Ukraine because they would arrive in a situation in which it is acceptable to have in this region, the media and the instruction in the Ukrainian language. And that actually is going to produce an important exception to the policies of cultural genocide that continue to be pursued on the shores of the Dnipro River. So in the 1950s and then again in the 1960s and 70s, the new waves of assimilation, attacks on Ukrainian patriotic intelligentsia, attacks on the churches in the 1950s, just to make sure that, that everything is under control of the Soviet power. And in, in a way, in a way, the fact that the Stalinist officials acknowledge this exception, acknowledge the failure in Western Ukraine. And of course, this acknowledgement is made against the background of armed resistance. And the fact that even the young people who only start university training under the Soviet power already still become Ukrainian nationalists. So this actually is a powerful defeat delivered to Stalinist cultural assimilation in one region. And ultimately, for the fate of Soviet Ukraine, if we look all the way to the 1980s, this is where the revival is going to begin. And it's going to begin with the same issues that uh, were most important for the cultural genocide as instituted under Stalin. The issue of the functioning of Ukrainian language, not of the existence of Ukrainian language, but of going beyond the niche. This is going to become the first public rally in Soviet Ukraine in 1988 in Lviv, next to the monument to Ivan Franko. From that public rally, the entire movement is going to emerge. And there is a logic, as we now realize, in the fact that the Ukrainian language had to be the first issue, which really was a political issue in the same way it was a political issue under Stalin as well. So ultimately then, I would argue that yes, we have a very clear drive towards cultural genocide, which followed upon the Holodomor as genocide, including Ukrainian culture and elites and, and the peasants. But the subsequent Soviet policies continued, continued this uh, definition of cultural genocide, except they failed, and they failed in what turned out to be the most crucial region. And this failure became apparent in the 1980s when mobilization became possible around the notion of restoring the rights of Ukrainian culture. So this understanding of the niche of being limited to ethnographic mode of singing and dancing Ukrainians was instinctively understood by the participants of the democratic movement, even if they were not Ukrainians, even if they were speakers of Russian in, in daily life, as, as an important moment of national oppression. And so the democratic movement for that very reason had support of minorities um, and the Ukrainian language and culture 
at first in the program of Ruch and subsequently going into most recent revolution became a powerful symbol of democratic transformation as it is in fact now when sociological polls show that even the people who do not use Ukrainian in daily life now tend to agree, the majority of them agrees, that the Ukrainian language is important for the notion of what Ukraine is, even so these people may not even use it in their daily life. And so then we have a Stalinist crime which delivered a crushing blow to the political Ukrainian nation created during the Ukrainian revolution. We have then a safe ethnographic mode, which was in itself a cultural genocide. And we have after the war, an important exception, which, which undermined this project. And in the end, the Ukrainians were able to fight back. Even so, it took them many decades. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yukelchik for a fascinating lecture. We have a number of questions. Uh, I think maybe Professor Sisson has something he wants to ask though. Oh no, I'm sorry. I thought you, you had a hand raised. You, we'll come back to you. Um, and I, I, I apologize. There, so I see a list of questions here. There was one question. Uh, uh, somebody wanted to for you to compare historians in Ukraine and in the West, and I tried to get clarification, but instead I managed to delete your question. So if you ask that question, please ask it again. It, it, the intention wasn't to silence you. Uh, we have some, some of these are comments, some are questions. Okay, from, from Roman Serbin. Uh, he comments, a very interesting development of ideas. My question, relation of this Stalin's culture building to project of state building, Russian state and Ukrainian state. So the relation of the, the culture building to the project of state building. Well, I think one of my big arguments here was actually the connection. Um, the understanding, the understanding that uh, the culture is political, and again, this is the kind of understanding the Russian Tsars had as well, right? Because this is why they prosecuted uh, Ukrainian culture within the Russian Empire so harshly, because they understood that it's a political choice which undermines undermines the unity of uh, Russian nation, the great Russian nation. And of course, I run out of time a little bit to talk about what actually happens in the late 1930s. And it would take me a while to explain in detail. But, but I think, um, as, as, as Professor Sarbin also knows, the thing here is that it was not enough to make the Russian nation the great one, kind of the big brother. It also required establishing um, relation of other Soviet nations to the Russian one. And that, question involved the issue of having a separate polity. I have to say that Ukrainian historians claimed always until the very collapse of the Soviet Union that the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic was a form of Ukrainian statehood. Now Stalin, as, as, as Professor Serbin shows, was more honest with it and argued that Ukrainian nation could exist without it. But the point here is once there is one great nation, the big brother, you need to define the others. And they are defined in a very interesting way, in a very tsarist way. Because the closest to the big brothers are Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Georgians. And here comes the religion, here comes the kind of traditional participation in Russian imperial service and all kinds of criteria which strike you as very colonialist. And here comes, as I have uh, written in the past, the re-evaluation of Bogdan Khmelnytsky too. Because in the 1920s, Bogdan Khmelnytsky is a colonialist who brings, uh, who brings the Ukrainian peasants under the exploitation of Russian Tsars and feudal lords. Whereas in the 1930s, he becomes a great historical figure because he helped unite. The term reunited is not, not yet used in the 1930s. It's actually invented after the war already. 
by a historian uh, who had been in his youth a student of Groshevsky, actually. Um, so then the, the definition of Ukrainian statehood and nationhood then exists in this um, combination with Russia. So at some point after the war, Molotov comes to, to Kyiv to, for the anniversary of the Ukrainian Socialist Republic to say that the Ukrainian people were second after the Russian nation on the road to communism, which is an official acknowledgement that you're closely related to the big brother ethnically, and you are the second on the wonderful road to communism. But all it really means is you are little Russians. You are part of the Russian nation. We have a question from Andrei Vinitsky. He first says, heartfelt thanks to Professor Yakelchik for an excellent wide ranging and stimulating lecture. And then he uh, comments on and would like you to comment on notions of collaboration, both during the physical phase of the genocide and subsequently. Um, uh, he has some comments about it and uh, the collaborators of the physical period exhibited a form of self-loathing, uh, seeking on Marxist-Leninist grounds to break with those who would keep Ukrainian Ukrainians mired in their past. And then the subsequent collaboration that terrorized Tachina. Um, any your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm not a specialist on the social history of uh, of the countryside under Stalin. But I, of course, obviously read and even reviewed, I think, for the Times Literary Supplement, the important book by Anne Applebaum, The Red Famine, in which it is shown very clearly and also comes up in the work of a person who was a research assistant um, on this project, Daria Mattingly, a now British historian, um, born in Ukraine, that it's time for us to acknowledge that this is significant share and the majority really of perpetrators in the countryside were Ukrainians, right? So we have to deal with this fact and uh, then understand the nature of totalitarian regimes reshaping uh, not only by fear, but also by allowing people to build their lives as enforcers. This is what happens in the literary circles, which I know better. Uh, and this is the kind of career Kornichuk, for instance, has as an enforcer who is subsequently sent even to Western Ukraine to make sure who is a good writer, who is a bad writer, who organizes all these campaigns, runs them uh, uh, ultimately. Um, but it's, it's, it's also true of, I think, the uh, social fabric of Stalinism. It's not just imposed on... Uh, coherent resisting group, but is imposed um, by way of splitting the group. And Lenin, forever the cynical and pragmatic politician, is very open about it. This is the entire project of uh, Komnezame, uh, the, the committees of the poor peasants. The entire project is to split uh, the village based on the social tensions that may or may not exist there, and allowing one group of the peasantry to survive and prosper in relative terms, nobody really prospers under Stalin, at the expense of the group, of the other group. And of course, it plays into all kinds of social uh, antagonisms on the ground and traditional rivalries. And, and it's a long list. But yes, um, yes, these people do participate. And uh, I think it was shown in the work of Daria Mattingly. I'm waiting for her book, actually. I was, I was the external on, on her thesis that you could see the traces of that in regional history museums and collective farm history museums still in the 60s and 70s. So the people who wrote the history of the villages were the ones who, were, who, committed, who committed genocide. And they got to write this history. And they are local, they are Ukrainian, but they are Stalinists. They killed. Right, so uh, Lenin and Stalin are kind of very clear about the need to manipulate, the need to divide and rule. They they never hide it. Lenin is really open about about it. We have a question from Edward Baidos. What are the links between the transfer of the capital city of the Ukrainian SSR from Kharkiv to Kiev and the whole of the war? In terms of culture, and well, maybe I'll give you both questions right away. In terms of culture and Ukrainianness, wasn't Kiev more Ukrainian than Kharkiv? Uh, 
If so, why move the capital of Soviet Ukraine to a place seen as more nationalistic than the Ukrainian capital was before 1934? That's a great question. I have an article on that, but it really more focuses on, on the history of the city, how the city was reshaped, who was arrested, exiled, and such. But the thing here is that um, prior to the year 1933, and as you see, so many things come together in the year 1932 and 33, there was an informal Soviet policy not to build uh, major factories in right bank Ukraine, including the city of Kiev, because the strategic thinking at the time was that this area would be lost. It would be lost in the foreign attack, which they thought would be combined with the invasion of uh, Ukrainians living abroad. Uh, so strategically, they sort of were prepared to give it up. But you now, of course, also thinking that, why would that be? Well, because they did not trust the peasantry. Um, and they did not trust the elites in the city of Kiev. The city of Kiev has a fascinating history, right? It's not a Ukrainian city in 1917. Um, when uh, when Colonel, Col Colonel Valets and his Osadny corpus are in Kiev, they feel like they're in an enemy city, really. So every time Strelci have to participate in a parade, they even bring soldiers from the hospital with them in order to show the Kievites that the Ukrainian army is strong. This is what is going on in Kiev uh, during the celebration of Zluka in particular. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the 1920s, Kiev is a very curious combination of two things the Soviets distrust. It's the old administrative and religious center of the Russian Empire. Both things are kind of highly questionable in terms of class or religious policies, but it's also the center of the Ukrainian Republic during the revolution. And it's a seat of the Ukrainian, all Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. And it's also the center of Ukrainian autocephalous movement, the church movement. So all the things that are wrong on both the Imperial Russian side and the Ukrainian side are concentrated in Kyiv. So the answer, you wouldn't find the answer anywhere in the archive. And actually the decision about the transfer of the capital was a surprise to Ukrainian leadership. The decision was made by Stalin. They were shocked when they found out, really. Um, so, so the decision is clearly connected to genocide. It's clearly connected to having crushed the Ukrainian resistance and believing that they would be able to reshape the Ukrainian nation in the Stalinist way. Therefore, Kyiv would no longer be dangerous. It's a kind of triumphal march on Kyiv. That's what it really is. Right? It's almost like, and, and they are going to reshape the city itself. I, I have an article about that, so I could talk about that, but that's not the essence of the question. So the city was reshaped. And that was also the moment when um, the Soviet leadership wants to make Kyiv an industrial city, to reclaim it in class terms, and also reclaim it in terms of no longer looking at it as an area which would be lost uh, in, in, in the case Ukrainian nationalists invade together with Poles and together with whoever. Because Stalinist view changes constantly. Either Poland with uh, Great Britain, either Poland with Germany, whoever is going to attack them and take Kyiv. Yeah, so it's basically the Holodomor which makes the transition possible. Uh, next question. How did Stalin's view of Ukraine as a nation differ from Lenin's? And would you speculate uh, if Lenin would have pursued a policy of cultural genocide in Ukraine? Of course he would. <laughs> like it's, yeah, this whole, this whole thing in, uh, in the late Soviet Union about bad Stalin and good Lenin, of course, um, somehow was left in the imagination of some in the West. Some leftists in the West somehow are stuck in the, in the notion that it was Stalin who corrupted the good Leninist project. But the reality, of course, is very different. They published telegrams from Lenin to Stalin about the need to be enormously cruel and hang people and whatever, to which Stalin re replies famously, 
uh, Comrade Lenin, please be assured that my hand would not tremble. So uh, we are going to do all these brutal things that you are demanding. I think um, Lenin is interesting in this respect because he, in 1919, finally has the time to look at the election map from the uh, Constituent Assembly, Uchreditelne um, Sabrania. And he looks at this election map and said, oh, wow, in so many Ukrainian provinces for which we have statistics, the Ukrainian parties won the elections. So that explains it, that must explain it. Then Lenin in 1919 does impose certain notions on the communist leadership in Ukraine that sound like concessions to the Ukrainian peasantry. Uh, the statement formally that Ukraine would be its own polity, not part of Russia, that the Ukrainian language would, would be respected. Um, and these are taken, they, these measures uh, generate resistance. But Lenin is obviously being pragmatic here because it is very clear, I think, to a historian looking at the Ukrainian revolution that the issue here is that the Bolsheviks cannot crush the peasantry just yet. And so they want to present themselves as a possible option for the peasantry, which they do. And this is one reason um, among many why the Bolsheviks actually win. But there is a moment which peasantry thinks that they would be acceptable, but that moment quickly changes once they start. Oh, thank you, thank you for circulating the title of my article. Yes, uh, because they realize quickly that it's going to be requisitioning. You're not going to keep the land you have captured during the revolution. So the Bolsheviks and the peasants are again on the course for a major clash. But there's a brief moment uh, in 1919 and also in part in 1920 when everybody is just so tired of it. And Yurko Tutunik writes about it in his memoir that going into the year 1920, you could sense that it's difficult now to do anything because the people are tired, they're traumatized, terrorized, they're hungry. Um, and this is the moment when the Bolsheviks sort of present themselves as a possible option, but it's not going to last, but it's going to help them strategically in that very year. Because already going in 1921, major rebellions, not only in Ukraine, but really throughout the Bolshevik polity, right? So Lenin, forever pragmatic, would most definitely do the same again. So use, use, use it as, as, as a means of mobilizing, of making it possible to reach out to the peasantry. But he would most likely agree with Stalin in Stalin's uh, letter from 1926 that it has to stop at the point of Ukrainianizing the workers in the cities. That should not happen. If the worker came from the village, it's okay. The worker can speak Ukrainian, it's okay, right? Uh, but do not touch the Russian workers. And when he says the Russian workers, you also realize he is not just speaking about the workers. He's also speaking about the Soviet apparatus in Ukraine, the entire Soviet apparatus. And there's of course statistical data also on, on, on the GPU, the secret police, and it's usually cited for kind of ethnic background of people who are in the secret police in Ukraine. But I think there is a bigger point uh, getting lost there. Yes, they belong to this or that group. But the big point is, is by social origins, most of them come from a very wrong social background. The petty bourgeois stratum of the cities. They are urbanites. They're urbanites from the Russian empire. And this is really important because they have a certain view of what Ukrainian language is, Ukrainian culture is, Ukrainian peasantry is, whatever ethnic background is, right? So we can we can decipher the names and and see who they are. But I think the point is the connection not to this or that particular uh, group, but rather to the Russian Empire itself and what the urban areas are in the Russian Empire. So that definitely informs us. I, I hope I've shown with the discussion of this 1926 circular uh, letter um, about Ukrainian separatism that, that the whole vocabulary borrowed straight from the Tsarist times. We have a question from Marta Dechok who says, thank you for a great talk. You mentioned Kiev, Lviv, Kharkiv, villages. Is there a Donbass dimension to this story which is perhaps unique? 
Donbass is unique in many ways. Yes, um, Donbass is primarily characterized in the 20th century by enormous mobility, by the constant change of the population, because contrary to the Soviet mythology of the great miners, nobody wants to be a miner. Uh, nobody wants to do this work. And also, if you read Khrushchev's memoirs, Khrushchev for the first time saw urban violence in the Donbass. That was a Jewish pogrom. So as a, as a preteen, actually, he, I think, came there at the age of 12. He sees uh, a pogrom there. And then he sees the workers mobilizing against the miners, trying to protect, trying to protect the other ethnic groups in the city from the violence organized by the miners. And this is this page of history actually straight away introduces us into the co concept of what Donbass is going to be during the revolution and the famine. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's possibly Petro Grigorenko, the prominent Ukrainian dissident, the former general of the uh, Soviet army, uh, who describes in his memoirs uh, the famine in the Donbass, uh, saying that that was the moment when you could see the difference, uh, that those who spoke Russian, that those who, who spoke Russian, that is not, that, um, it's, I don't think it's 1933, I think he's talking about, about the earlier famine of 1921, possibly, that there was an immediate, an immediate difference about how the village looked at those who were Russian and who were Ukrainian, Voroshilov actually says in his memoir. And yes, I had, I had to read this fantastic memoir by Marshal Voroshilov for work. You can't be jealous of my reading. Uh, he says that in the Donbass, the villagers always distinguished who was Ukrainian and who was Russian. Here we go with constructed identities and other modernist notions. Because he says, um, the Russians who resettled in the Donbass uh, kept separate. So they kept separate ways and there could be two villages next to each other. One would be very clearly Ukrainian ethnographically and the other very clearly Russian. And that divide was not uh, overcome quickly. Um, and so Horenko speaks of it as well, about the survival strategies, how that influenced uh, who, was, uh, who was whom. And then um, of course, the Soviets did it to the Donbass to a significant degree by recruiting the Red Army. That's it's a major episode of uh, of uh, the Bolsheviks winning against the whites is the famous argument between Stalin and Trotsky about whether we should, which way the Red Army should go to the Don. And Stalin wins with an argument that they should go through the Donbass. The official interpretation, because the workers there were so conscientious. The reality, the industry collapsed and there was a colossal, ma colossal mass of very violent miners who would be recruited into the Red Army, helping the Reds win with immense violence in the dawn, which also, by the way, explains this violence in the dawn, because of course, uh, they would see the Cossacks as the opposite, not for class reasons, but for reasons of traditional kind of social estates. The Cossacks suppress, suppress uh, discontent among miners. Miners hate the Cossacks because they are wealthy. And it's kind of a regional conflict with the Bolsheviks present present. And of course, the Donbass has Ukrainian writers, yes. And it keeps producing Ukrainian writers and cultural figures going into the late end of the Soviet period. And I don't need to name all of them. And Ivan Zuba, I think, very well in his memoir, describes what it was to be like, that was possible to be, kind of, he's trying to be a Stalinist Ukrainian as a student. And I think that's a beautiful description of how what, what it means exactly, how he's crying when Stalin dies and the entire dormitory is crying. And at the same time, Zuba realizes he is not Russian, right? So this kind of compromised position of cultural kind of acceptance of Ukrainian identity as a niche turns out to be impossible in the long run for him. Uh, there is terror in the Donbass, absolutely. Um, and in the Donbass, it actually has this added dimension of uh, kind of industrial subversion alleged by the Soviet power. Um, there is at least one group in the Donbass writers group which switches from Ukrainian to Russian. And I, I just forgot the name of it. Right in the middle of the Great Terror, 
in realizing that Ukrainian members are going to be arrested. Um, the Donbass actually has a story which is rewritten over and over again. And as, as many of us probably know, after World War II, the government of Soviet Ukraine has to order the creation of a newspaper in Ukrainian for the Donbass because they have just recruited, often by violent means, Ukrainians from the countryside and from Galicia to work in the mines. And now they need to reach them out, to reach out to them in the Ukrainian language. That's one of those forgotten, forgotten stories of the Donbass. And sorry, I forgot the second question. No, the second question was from previous, previous. Yeah. okay, sorry. Um, and now we have a question about Crimea. Um, the, the questioner asks, we, we've heard how um, it was given to Ukraine as a favor to a friend by Khrushchev, but what uh, do you think the real explanation is given what you've spoken about tonight? Khrushchev was a bit of a nation builder, I have to say. Right? So he wanted to get Zakharzonia as well. There is a file in the Communist Party archives in Kyiv uh, about the collection of signatures in Zakharzonia, Yaroslav and home, about the willingness to be reunited with Soviet Ukraine. So he, Khrushchev had a bit of, of, of this kind of nation building fever without actually speaking Ukrainian. But you realize too, that he is a Soviet bureaucrat who wants to enlarge his domain and its importance and its significance. That's what he really is doing, right? Um, but when he does so, it's also an answer to the Ukrainian revolution in a way. Right, so I, I, I once said in an interview when asked whether it was Stalin who reunited Ukraine, I said, no, it was Khrushchev's wife, right? Because Khrushchev's wife, who is by herself from uh, Zakarzonia and participated in the military struggles of, uh, of the revolutionary times, and of course he, uh, she, was, she was on the kind of left there, but she represented the answer to the concept of subornist, which was already very much present and developed by the Ukrainian revolution. So therefore, whatever Stalin and Khrushchev were doing was the answer to that subornist. And with Crimea, there is also a file from 1944, a very interesting one, which does not contain any, um, it, it actually, I think my answer is going to be determined by what it says. It focuses on the economic situation of the Crimea now after the Red Army came back. And basically the content is, it's a complete ruin. Just it needs to be restored completely, rebuilt, reconstructed. Um, so Khrushchev, uh, if he wanted, as family members actually confirmed that he wanted already during the war in 1944, because for the logic of uh, the economy, that made sense. Uh, receiving water from Crimea and Ukraine would of course have to restore the rebuild, but for that it would possibly be able to ask for more funds from the central government. So as a good apparatchik, he is always thinking, well, I can enlarge my domain, but I can get more funding for that, possibly. And this is what happened, because the construction of a North Crimean uh, uh, channel was like the most important economic development in Crimea after World War II. And that was done with Ukrainian hands from the Ukrainian budget and provided back then uh, the water, which was not back then really important for the people, but rather for agriculture. It changed the character of Crimean agriculture drastically. So Khrushchev uh, had a different logic. He had a different logic. And I have to say that Crimea was being rebuilt very slowly. Like Sevastopol remained really a ruin until 1948 when Stalin visited. Uh, and then the investments started going into Sevastopol, but the rest of the peninsula remained basically. So it was during the, uh, after, after the transition to Ukraine that uh, the peninsula's economy was being rebuilt. And I've recently served as um, ex an external on one very interesting uh, doctoral thesis. <laughs> where one chapter was about the absent Ukrainization in Crimea and the fact that 
the Crimean functionaries, all of them Russians from Russia, were so frightened of possible Ukrainization that they insisted on a clarification. And then the Ukrainian party leadership has to come to Crimea and say, no, we don't use the term Ukrainization and we are not going to pursue any Ukrainization here. And it also it's a striking moment when the past catches up with you, when they can use this argument against you because the functionaries realize Ukrainization was dismissed as a petlurite Ukrainization. You cannot really talk about it. So what, if you try to do anything, they can accuse you of being what, a petlurite? Impossible in political sphere. So it's, it's one of those moments when Stalinist terror against the cultural intelligence and Stalinist cultural genocide really, which makes it impossible to speak of Ukrainization, contributes to Crimea preserving its Russian character even after being transferred to Ukraine. We have a comment you may or may not want to respond to. Um, the questioner says, I relate to Soviet Sharavashchina here in BC. Uh, several years ago, we were trying to raise the idea of a Holodomor monument in Vancouver, and we approached the Association of Ukrainian Dance Groups for an opportunity to announce the plan. But the answer was, no thanks, that's political. So there is a great difference between Sharavarshchina and Ukrainian consciousness. I would not elaborate on the developments in British Columbia other than to say that last year, I think, our legislature actually officially acknowledged the Holodomor as genocide um, based on a submission by the then leader of the Green Party of British Columbia, who came from a family of Holodomor survivors and who gave a very powerful speech at the legislature. And uh, he, he, uh, he comes from the same family as Bogdan Kravchenko. His uh, mother was a sis, sis, is the sister of Bogdan Kravchenko. So it's a family which experienced the Holodomor in Eastern Ukraine. And we also had um, a, a, a vice president and provost of my university who recently announced that she's retiring, who also came from a family of Holodomor survivors. And I found out about that when we marked the 75th anniversary and I was given a talk and she approached me after the lecture and I thought, aren't you the, the provost? And she said, yeah, I am, but, uh, but I'm also from the family of survivors. So. Oh, what's, Alexander, are there are a few people asking whether this is being recorded and whether it will be available. And I was quite sure the answer was yes, yes, okay. I was also hoping the answer would be yes, because I came up with some things being inspired by your questions, which I would like to remember. Fr Frank, I think you're, you would like to speak. Oh, not, not to speak, I, just uh, one comment and question. Uh, you pointed out later the Galicians going to Donbass but I think as well, the reverse oppor opportunities for Galicians. The second Galician migration uh, was not destroyed the way the first was. Money to the villages. I who follow church affairs see that if you look in Odessa Oblast and find out where the new Orthodox church is getting parishes, you frequently find out these are boycos who've been moved at a certain point. But I think even more important, filling the positions that are permitted to Ukrainian speakers and Ukrainian intelligentsia. By, at least by the 1970s, I would assume a considerable number of Galicians are going that way, having been educated in the system. So I thought that was, and then the other is just the, the counterfactuals of history. Uh, to, I mean, to a great degree, uh, the areas of Eastern Ukraine had a, and the villages had a much greater potential economically for rapid social mobilization than did Galicia or Bukovina or Transcarpathia. I mean, it's almost a, a, a uh, surprise of history that these relatively poor agricultural regions of Ukraine are those where a uh, national movement based on peasantry moving to cities exists. So that in a certain way, one hates to say the diabolical nature of Stalin uh, but he was a cunning man, 
where do you see that? There have been some, uh, that is, the degree of social mobilization of the villages that occurs by 1930. Uh, how, how much of a progress was being made at that point and uh, how quickly therefore would they have been able to broaden not only the Ukrainian intelligentsia, but a whole series of other, other groups moving to the cities, but having convenient relations with the villages as a possibility. Yeah, that's actually, that's a great, well, first of all, it's a great comment, uh, Frank. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Um, kind of these, these are two very different areas and, and Stalin, I'm sure, realized the importance of, uh, of areas in central Ukraine for crushing any potential for, for mobilization. But um, there is also this argument about the Ukrainian revolution in exact same areas. On the one hand, on the one hand, we have statements even from the red side, from the red commanders uh, and the secret police types that there is chauvinistic, meaning Ukrainian nationalistic attitude in the villages and the villages appear united in that. But on the other hand, of course, when the Ukrainian uh, Republic is trying to raise an army, it's not having much success in central Ukraine and nothing comparable to what, to what is happening in Galicia, right? So it's, it then points out to, I think, what, uh, what we should recognize as a peculiar nature of peasant mobilization. Uh, so that uh, they do get mobilized when they see economic interests as being aligned with national interest. And when that happens, then there is a very interesting situation on which so many people comment in the 1920s. And it comes up in Yefremov's uh, diary, it comes up in Velikovich's Nana Vina by Pihido Pravoberezhny, that once Petlura was gone, everybody loved Petlura because they realized that the Bolshevik policies um, are basically going to attack you on both sides, both as a national organism and as a social group. So now, now these people start mobilizing under the slogans of the Ukrainian People's Republic. And then, you know, those filmmakers in Ukraine um, who want to make movies and write novels uh, about the heroics of Ukrainian resistance during the Ukrainian revolution, they end up with the Ottomane of 1921, 1923, rather than, rather than the army of the Ukrainian revolution. And it points to the fluid nature of, of, of peasants as, as, uh, as, as a group, so that they are connected to the land in, in a deep and meaningful way. And if they support resistance, that would be the resistance in that particular area. And I think this is the strength of uh, Ukrainska Postanska Army after the war and in the late years of the war. But if they were to mobilize to actually establish contact with the city, intelligence. I think in Stalin's time, that would not really be possible as such because both sides understand the artificial character of this connection. And we get, we get lots of, you probably remember all this uh, kind of trips of writers to the village to agitate for the collective farm, right? Like everybody knows that the writers realize the collective farm is a shame. It's second slavery. And the peasants talking to them realize it's a shame. It's second slavery. This is what is going to happen. We are going to die of hunger. And yet both sides kind of embrace the language of, uh, I'm not going to say the Bolshevik language, kind of the language of moral economy, which reflects that, oh, we should be equal. So we we'll get rid of the kulaks, the kurkul. So in a sense, they just speak to each other in Soviet language under Stalin. And it's almost difficult to imagine. But of course, if he didn't have any diaries, if Arkady Lubchenko, for instance, if his diary did not survive, we would have a very different views of uh, Ukrainian writers in, in the 1930s. So they probably know, like some of them have family in the village, but they also project themselves in a Soviet way. And I deal with that with, um, in other chapters of that book. This is, this is going to be a book about this whole strange custom of Soviet Ukrainian writers to dress up in a jacket, wearing a tie, and then after shaving and everything, sit and write so that they kind of write in a different almost mascara, not as themselves, 
and and later like after the war like uh, Stelmach is a he hero of socialist labor so he, not only he would be sitting at, at the desk fully dressed with a, with a gold star of the hero of socialist labor and only then he writes and then you think well that's what cultural history teaches us <laughs> kind of they dress up to be something kind of these soviet writers in order precisely perhaps to to disguise the fact that they are ukrainians um, and so with the Red Army stationed in such an enormous numbers in Ukraine, because this is, this is the region where they expect the war to start, right? So the Red Army garrisons all around the place, the secret police informers all around the place. And when reading these files from the archive with Volna Horuhu, the stunning thing is that in every group, there are people who sound like normal patriotic Ukrainians who just say, this is a lie, this never happened. I do believe that uh, that something is terribly wrong as Soviet Ukraine, but that never happened, what you are charging me. But also in every group, there is some someone who says, oh, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you now. And this person participated in the conspiracy and that one, and it's easy to see the names. Some of One of them was uh, head of the major publishing house, Ruch in Kharkiv. And then he led to the deaths like dozens of Ukrainian cultural figures, and they know it. Like they know they are informers. Even after the war in the 50s, um, there was a trip, I think, of Sosura and somebody else uh, to, to Western Ukraine. And this group consists of like, several informers in the group. And Sosura receives a note from the audience saying, like, we really sympathize with you because you were being attacked for Love Ukraine, for your wonderful poem. And everybody is watching Sosura the way he reacts because he has to react in a Soviet way by saying, no, that was the wrong poem. So I was wrong in writing this poem. So everybody is watching everybody and the system was established very early on. The Ukrainian HPU um, uh, in Ukraine is established in 1923, like the same year as Ukrainization. And it has an enormous network. And I think we are all under the impression that East German uh, Stasi was like the worst and most developed service ever. But this is only because so many files were lost uh, in Ukraine uh, when the Germans invaded in 1941 and when the Soviet Union collapsed. And before the Soviet Union collapsed, they managed to move so many files to Moscow. If it were not for that, we would have had an enormous archive and we would have a very different idea also of what um, Soviet Ukraine was in around year 1930. So it's, uh, it's difficult for me to imagine any Ukrainian cultural figure joining the peasant rebels, really. They, they would be too afraid. And that's what Stalinism did to them over the period of time. And this is what cultural genocide also is. That, that sounds like it might be a good place to stop. We've been going now for more than two hours. Um, Frank, I'd, uh, maybe you want to make any final comments? Or, I do want to make sure before I forget to thank Alexander Pankayev, uh, without whom we would not be able to do this because he's the technical wizard who makes it all possible. So thank you so much, Alexander, for um, facilitating. And also, of course, our co-organizers. And with that, I'll, I'll, Frank, I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, so I would like to thank uh, Professor Yakelchik. Uh, I, I see that uh, people stayed uh, and uh, were fascinated with this talk. I think it also it was very important for our, our research and work on the whole of the more to open up to issues of culture uh, and these various other relations. Uh, but still, uh, I am stunned uh, by uh, the breadth and length of, uh, of the territory that you have covered uh, in uh, merely two hours. Uh, an amazing ability to draw together so many links uh, and give us a broader picture of Stalinism as well as uh, the announced topic. I think it's one of the, the interests of the, of HREC, of the whole of the Moore Center, has been how to reach out to specialists in Soviet history. Uh, we have had 
uh, many contacts with people in genocide studies, famine studies, uh, other related fields. Uh, Soviet his history has seemed to be, as practiced in North America, a much more conservative group at taking on this issue. However, I now feel uh, calmer about this, uh, just to think that anyone who has nine books is also working on the Stalinist period uh, means that we will have an entree into a younger generation. And with what you describe of even the archives that remain, uh, one wishes that they were all there, uh, but even the uh, material that is open, uh, we can find uh, a, another generation uh, that will be working on this for a long time. So thank you very much. Uh, and we much appreciate your talk. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you for organizing this event. And you're doing a very important work, Hrek and the people here. And I think you have a very grateful audience as well.